Welcome to Stranger Connections, where I celebrate wonderfully weird people and quirky stories. I'm your curious beast and host, Lisa David Olson, the practically world-famous business humorist, interactive speaker, and speaker trainer. So reach out to me if you want to reignite your team or event. Today, we talk with Kim Corbin. She calls herself the conflict queen, and I wasn't sure if that meant she creates conflict, and then I realized she does not because both of us blamed ourselves when we couldn't connect via email. Oh, no, it's my fault. No, no, no. You go first. That's fine. So please welcome the very lovely Kim Corbin. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Lisa. We, you know, I'm just so delighted that we're connecting. The same, same. It was not easy between <laughs> email hiccups and just no, and, life. And, and here... And hearing you say Minnesota, and I'm just like, oh, you're Norwegian, and so am I, and Lefsa, and so, yeah. We did. We covered a little bit before I hit record, and you asked where I'm from, and when I say the state, it's just apparent that I am in the Midwest, because it's Minnesota. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. <laughs> Thank you for being here, and I know about you a little bit, that you're a retired lawyer and a former judge of landlord tenant disputes. So that sounds fun. I don't know why you'd give all that up. I mean, everybody comes in and says, thanks, you're doing a swell job. Yeah, everybody's everybody's happy when they come to see a lawyer <laughs> or when they have a dispute and want you to decide who's telling the truth. <laughs> right. Exactly that. And I oh. actually, I, I actually, it was one hearing landlord and tenant dispute and the landlord and the tenant, I helped them settle. And the tenant seemed to be a nice guy. He was down on his luck. And I wrote my husband's name, my second husband, his name and number on a sticky note. And I gave it to the tenant. The landlord was still there. And I said, look, my husband is crewing a big concert. He's having trouble finding people. You give him a call. And the landlord was thrilled because oh, this tenant's going to be able to come up with some money to pay rent that's owing. Right. But I'm sitting there doing this thinking, if the powers that be knew I was doing this, it would be an international incident. I bet. And 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 maybe I shouldn't be <laughs> doing this. <laughs> if if doing what's, you know, if helping people is more important than following the rules, well. Well, and that aligns with one of your quotes that you say, you're the CEO of your life. That's a yes. heck of a way to say, make good choices because this is on you. <laughs> I mean, we we need to say, this is my life and, and quit blaming everybody else for where we're at. We really do. And of course, if you go through divorce, you're really down on yourself and you're feeling like a failure and you give away your power. And that's how you end up spending a lot of money that you don't mm. need to. Right. And and I remember from being a lawyer, having one client, she and her husband, they needed a mediator to help them divide spices. Come on. No. <laughs> Who got the cinnamon? I I never asked. Oh, I, okay. I didn't want to add to the expense and I just had to keep a straight face. But I thought, you've got to be kidding. You know, they were not done being married. If you're coming down to spices, you are not done being married. You had some other other directions you could use your energy. Well, what it says is somebody has to be in control. One of them really had right. to be in control. Right. And wasn't about to relinquish that power. For sure. Yeah, I, I worked for a short time in a lawyer's office and one of the divorces was like three banker bankers boxes full. This is everything was on paper back then and and it was all because the two couldn't speak to each other. And so a call comes in, the husband calls, tell my wife she forgot to leave the snow boots when she dropped off the kid at school. And boom, there was back then, back in the early 2000s, that was $2,000. Or I'm sorry, that was 80 bucks for the phone call mm -hmm. to the phone call. And I'm just like, wow, that's so sad because the kid is the pawn. Well, and, and what it is, is the legal system when divorce moved from parliament to court it was just plopped into civil law which is contract disputes 
And it was done at a time when women and kids were property. Mm. So the word custody is actually a property term. Oh, wow. Right. So this is the backstory that people just accept as a given. And I know when I was thinking about ending my marriage, that's when I realized I was terrified of traditional divorce. You know, mm -hmm. like I'd had that woman need a mediator for spices. And it was like, I can't do this to my kids. Yeah. And so I basically stick handled it myself and said to him, this is what we're going to do. And I didn't push any legalities for almost two years. Jeepers. But it was like, no, no, here's, you know, what you're supposed to be paying for child support. So keep paying the mortgage and, and property taxes. So he didn't feel as rejected. Mm -hmm. Right. It wasn't this clear me versus you. And you bring up a good point. If you're not being a big, strong wall, there, people's defenses don't have to be ready to fight tooth and nail for the garlic salt versus the Himalayan pink salt. You know, exactly. they can, if if somebody somebody has to be the the bigger person and just go, you know what? Let's just let's just work it out. Stuff is just stuff. So well, I'm twice and... divorced. So I'm easy to divorce, is what I call myself. Three times married. So love me some honeymoons. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> honeymoons are the best part. <laughs> yes, I, I, um, I'm easy to divorce, except, you know, the first one we had kids. So that got scary for both of us. But once we mm -hmm. realized we both just wanted to raise them in kind, when we stopped listening to the parents outside of the marriage, mm -hmm. everything got so much better. So I know. how do you do that? How do you keep, you know, the the mother-in-law who's all ballsy and telling you what you should do and all the other voices? You know, we could talk about the boundaries and the privacy. Well, but it's it's really about getting like so when I divorced, I knew that kids love their parents no matter what. Mm-hmm. Because I'd worked on a really ugly child protection file. Oof. And a social worker would always say that. And yeah. that stuck with me. So I had this North Star goal, which was my kids having the best relationship possible with their dad. And I figured it would take about five years. And so I've actually, like, I've created some exercises that get people to remember, oh, yeah, I love this person once. And to really sit down and discuss their hopes and dreams for their kids in a way that isn't threatening or positional. And then you just evaluate all potential decisions against what you want for your kids. Right? So you're you're using this trans, you know, divorce is something, oh, well, my kids can learn resilience. Mm -hmm. and it's better for kids to see, have happy parents. And the research really is that it's conflict that harms kids. Right. And, and to that, I... I just think if you stay with someone who is possibly abusing you, whether it's verbally, whether it's physically or just not respecting you, and if you stay with that person because, well, we have to stay married for the kids, you are teaching them the wrong way to be married or the wrong way to choose a partner. So when people think, oh, I have to stay together for the kids. My parents did that. That was no favor. And so, you know, I, I did not repeat that pattern, but that can happen. Oh, well... My parents were crummy together, but they stayed together. So I'll just endure this. Well, and it's it's interesting, right? Like, because my parents are much the same. They're still together. And it's only kind of the last five years they've been good together out of 60. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, okay. But the interesting thing is, is we expect people in the public sphere to have boundaries, to be able to communicate effectively, right? Um, not to settle, but, you know, to be able to be assertive. But we don't teach them that in at home. And we wonder, why do they have problems with it? Right? And I remember when my daughter was about 10 and she started saying, I don't want to go to dad's. It's boring there. We always have macaroni and cheese on Tuesdays. <laughs> and I'm like, but honey, like, 
here we can eat and it's always at 5 30 and I'm like but here we eat any time between five and nine and it could be a bowl of cereal but having the conversation with her about how important it is to be exposed to different ways of being hmm. and how you can love somebody and not like their behavior they're not mutually exclusive Absolutely. And you say that divorce can be the best gift that you give yourself and your children. That's that's a bold statement. Not many people will say that. Well, that's been my experience. And uh, I've seen it with my son, who's now an adult, but he was afraid of his dad. Like, I remember his dad allergic to cats. We went to the Humane Society once. My son found a cat. A kitten that he really liked and he's mom can we bring this kitten home and I'm like but honey you can't you know your dad's allergic and he said I can get a new dad <laughs> and I thought oh he's just being cute you know he was five or six oh, he's just being cute no oh, he was wow. serious he wanted a new dad oh right that was the state of their relationship and they went on, um, he went to Europe with his dad for about 10 days when he was 12. And his dad would go on all the band trips with him. Like he ended up with a really good relationship with his dad. And so my son ended up like, and I was thinking he was acting so poorly when his dad and I were together, it, like that he was going to end up in jail wow. as a teenager. Goodness. And I mean, as a lawyer, your mind goes to the worst possible outcome. Yeah, that's true. You've seen it all. The future. Yeah. The future I saw for him. But no, he ends up going to university, getting scholarship, finding a chair in the symphony, doing wow. his last year of in French when he hadn't studied any French in nine years. He dove into a French immersion program. And, you know, and then having the courage to go, Mom, music isn't fun anymore like this. So right now he's in the armed forces reserves on the West Coast. And I'm like, you had enough. You knew who you were enough to walk away from that instead of listening to your mentors. And I know if we'd stayed together, he wouldn't be as resilient. Like it has been such a gift for him. And it gave him space to develop a really good relationship with his dad. Oh, that's so cool. Because without the issues between the parents hanging in the house or any of that. And it sounds like you're a good, strong mom, though, saying, because here's something that's awful. The parents apart, putting down the other parent. Yeah, and that you just, can't do that. Oh, that just hurts my heart. Because you, as an adult, chose to be with that person. And you made a baby with that person. So grow up and just don't make their lives in the middle of your issues. That your example is so loving and sweet that you well and, wanted, and you thing, opened that door. I opened it and I could hardly stand to see my husband. Right? Like I am the woman who he left his beer bottle collection here. Everywhere he would travel, he'd buy a craft beer, he'd bring it home was on a shelf in our living room. I thought it was tacky. And I didn't dispose of them right away. I think it was maybe three years later. He hadn't taken them oh into the garbage or recycling. Yes. I forget which. I feel guilty about that now. But I share that. Like, I was no saint. But it was that what my kids needed made me bigger than I could be for me. The love of my children forced me to grow. And as a mediator, every now and again, like I hear from people who are asking their six-year-old where they want to live, and I'm just have my mouth zip shut. Well, I shouldn't say that. Mediation, I actually was rather tired. And I said, are you too sure you love your kids? And then I thought, oh, that was supposed to be an inside voice, Kim. But it went over well. But <laughs> Part of um, digging through your wonderful website, which we'll, we'll share that there's a free gift for listeners on your website. But one of the things I came across is so interesting to me, and it's strategies for negotiating with a narcissist. Negotiating with a narcissist? Is that possible? 
Well, he, here's the deal. You don't negotiate with a narcissist. Often the narcissists don't want to work with lawyers because they want to um, they want to get their own way. And and the tendency is if you've been with a narcissist to think, oh, I'm just going to be reasonable. And he'll be reasonable too. That is a recipe for disaster. And often when you've been with a narcissist and you go to a lawyer and those are the instructions you give, no, no, we're just going to start being reasonable. No, 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 no. <laughs> what you do is you have to inflate what you want because the narcissist has to win. And you can start knowing that. That's how you start your strategy piece. Okay, they have to win. And... If you're going to go 50-50 head-to-head in the legal system, you're going to be torn to shreds. I mean, you've worked in a lot, like you know, mm -hmm. because it was set up for people who tell the truth. And it isn't about justice. It's about following the legal rules and everybody ends up feeling bruised and nobody likes the results. So you figure out, okay, what do I need from this? What is most important to me? I'm not going to play it as if, that's what's most important to me. I'm going to add some other things to make this more interesting. Win on things that I don't care about. So maybe act approach. like you love the the bottle collection, but yes, okay, exactly. I'll give you that if you give me, you know, the the orange chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the things you say about strategies for successfully negotiating with a narcissist was don't respond immediately silence is your friend i don't think a lot of us can do that part that's a great well tip. i gotta so, write so, that one so, down so what i teach my clients and i'll share it here is to play the batshit crazy game <laughs> i'm listening <laughs> Somehow I knew I could share that here, Lisa. Heck yes. <laughs> the batshit crazy game. Of course, they hook you with their words. And if you respond immediately, you're done. So you need something to give you pause, to make you pause. And to get you out of that fear response. So the batshit crazy game is just he says something and to stop and go, oh man, if this... If this was my friend on a scale of one to 10, how batshit crazy would I say this is? So you're pulling in your brain that analyzes, but it's in a fun way that you can kind of laugh about. Oh, I it's an eight. This. Okay. And you don't say you're batshit crazy. You just say, oh, well, that's interesting. I, I, uh, <laughs> I haven't thought of it that way before, and I'm just going to need some time to think about it and walk away. Wow. That's fantastic. Because they want you to yell. They want you to break something. They want you to react. If I can get you to react, I win. The same You're with hooked. trolls on the internet. People fight. That's not a loaf of bread. That's that's a, a baguette. Damn it. No, we all well, want to be right. And And that's where you get hooked. Like, who cares about being right? Because logic is never going to convince them. Right, right. So give it up. Like, they don't have to know what's true to validate you. You know. And if, if you play the batshit crazy game, what's fun is because it makes people, makes the women I share it with, they laugh, but they use it. And it helps them go, oh, yeah. And I always say, and write it down, what, it, what happened and the score. So you can look back and it <laughs> gives you back your power. Not immediately. But you start seeing the trends. Oh, right. Because otherwise they're in your head. But taking those notes and saying that that gives you your power back is fantastic. And you say to always share how something will benefit the narcissist. Oh, yeah. Well, Love they have to that. win. Yes. So you just have to reframe. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, like having the kids for a week at a time. That's, you know, you work so hard. And you're tired at the end of the day. And, you know, and the kids deserve to spend time with you when you're at your best. Because I want you to have a really great relationship with them. And how do we make this happen? 
and you just got more time with your kids. Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. I'm kind of a gorilla fighter. I love that though. You're the best kind of gorilla because it's, it's you, your example was the betterment of the kids. And so I think that's fantastic. So this is really good stuff. Um, The co-parenting boundaries and something else that um, our mutual friend Carolyn mentioned was cake life community and cake was all in caps, which it should be. But what is cake life community? So cake life has a couple different meanings. And one is conflict is kindness every day. Because I don't know about you, but if I'm not in conflict with somebody in my house or in my business, I'm in conflict with me. Ooh. Right? And it's learning to be kind in it. You know, and it's like that conversation with my daughter about you can love somebody and not like their behavior. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And then it also is a community of women who are authentic, kind, and empowered. So it's a community for women who are going through ugly divorces. And uh, these ladies speak their truth. True. Like it's actually, it's, and what it is, is it's way, like, did you feel really alone that first divorce? And like a failure? Oh my gosh, yes. And, and so what it is, is it's a community of mm. women who just, they get it. Oh yeah, this is me. Oh, I could have used that, man. And it involves a sister circle, which essentially is a mastermind, but sharing this is my biggest challenge and then being supported mm. by women who are going through it. It's way empowering. And we had a session on Saturday and I was actually talking about the history of divorce and how it's a patriarchal institution. And like, and one of the women in Canada, anyway, we didn't have no fault divorce until 1985. And she commented, she found it so powerful because she had known her grandmother had been in an abusive marriage and had never left. But when she found out about you couldn't just leave, until 1985 it was oh that's what happened Hmm. and one of the other women was you know we celebrated getting married we need to celebrate divorce we need a cake and i'm like where do you think the name comes from no we need a real cake kim oh all right we'll have to have a a real cake sometimes (laughs) yeah and it doesn't have to be about bashing the ex i I find it that really offensive, it, like Valentine's Day places where they have black Valentine hearts. Let's bring a picture of your ex to rip up. That's putting yourself down, I think. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, people are people and hurt people hurt people. And you can say that this person, and I don't use ex, I use former spouse. Mm. You can say that your former spouse is behaving in a very controlling manner and he isn't very nice and he's still the father of the children and you don't have to be a victim and you don't have to you know like you can be strong i think it's more of a buddhist perspective of strong it isn't rigid but it's strong kind of in a softer way which is how i would describe me you know or yeah. those guerrilla tactics with with it's not head to head but it's you don't have to have spikes on the outside of you you can just be strong within I like that that's much better yeah so that's what that's what happens in cake life and people can join this by getting a hold of you yes yeah and it's actually I I might have a price on the website I've just I was just listening to a Dan Sullivan book about contribution and it's like yeah I want more people in this it doesn't have to be this huge huge investment so it's like 58 canadian a month for a minimum three month commitment if that's how people want so that's like 40 bucks a month us very nice and you can go to the conflictqueen.ca or kim at kimcorvin.com and corvin is k-o-r-v like victor e-n.com and you mentioned you have a free flow chart on the website for our listeners. 
Yeah, so on on the landing page at or the the home page, I guess it's called at theconflictqueen.ca. There's a button right at the top and it is for a flow chart how to divorce. It's what I used when I thought about it afterwards. What did I actually do? And it starts with about how to commit to the kids and interacting with lawyers is somewhere close to the end. Mm. But it's just this very simple outline of what you need to do. And yeah, you you join my list, you get the flow chart. If you want to unsubscribe from my list, that's okay. Right. Yeah. But you if you go it. to it's... the website, it's easy to sign up on the mailing list. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And there's great testimonials on there. That's how I learned a lot about what you do. But I cannot let you escape to go eat the rest of your lapsa right now until I ask you to share a dare or a prank story. One you've done, I, had done to you. And I do have lapsa in my freezer. That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> I know. I, I stocked up before Christmas. <laughs> and I'm saving it. You know? Yes. All right. So... Just don't let it get burnt. <laughs> So you know how in nearly every organization you will find a man who's in a power position and he thinks very highly of himself, right? I he do. doesn't get everything right, but he, and he wants more power and he acts all nicey nice on the outside. But when you start paying attention, there's some darkness, right? Right. And uh, I was involved in it. I was on a board of an organization once, and uh, there was a fellow like that. And, you know, most people thought, oh, he was just so great. And he was so full of himself. And it always had to be his way. And there were also these rumors, these whispers of infidelity, right? Because, you know, these powerful guys, women can be attracted to them. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a group of us in town for a board meeting. And one of the women had brought this cartoon book called Cucumbers Are Better Than Men Because dot 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 have you ever seen it i think so i think it's right next long... to the everybody poops book <laughs> no <I'm laughs> a long kidding. time ago <laughs> anyway so she shows some of us and we're laughing about you know reading it just roaring with laughter oh, God. and somebody suggested we should give it to this guy oh and then we start oh but you know if he knows we give it to him, there's going to be all kinds of retribution because he's that kind of guy and he's very <laughs> powerful. So it became my task. Really? So I went to the office oh, and I got a, a mailing sticker label for his <laughs> address to him. Or I might've had a staff person make it up. I got a, uh, an envelope that would hold it saying it was from the organization I then went to the post office oh my word and I didn't have my envelope um I didn't have it sealed yet I don't think but I gave maybe I did I don't remember maybe I did have it sealed but I gave the envelope went to the post office right to weigh it I got a stamp on it you know that said the date and and then the poor person who works there tries to take my envelope and I'm like nope and I pull it back no no it's my envelope uh, and so it ended up we just as we were filing in for this meeting after lunch we just put it on the stack of mail for him by the secretary oh you didn't want it to run through the post office you just no wanted we wanted to good. see him get it oh so, but he's Mr. Retribution, right? Oh, so no. we had to be very pretending we're not looking oh, as man. he's opening his mail during the meeting, you know, because he's an important guy. He can do that. He doesn't need to listen to anybody. Oh. But when he opened it, 
the look on his face, right? And he's looking around the room trying to figure out who did it. And he never he never mentioned it. Oh, really? Which which suggests that perhaps there was something to the stories going around. <laughs> right. Just, his right. reaction was just Who's, who's got photos of us? <laughs> <laughs> I'm picturing that was a nice my prank. I love it. I love that one. I, I also love that you messed with the person at the post office by reclaiming your mail that you just paid for. <laughs> they're like, they're still telling that story. Yeah, this lady. This well, and, and and I guess that's me, you know, like there's times when I just don't take no. It's like, no, it's right. mine. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I'll, Not I'll put today. It in, I'll, I want to put it in my own special mailbox. I think I said something like that. Oh, funny. Yeah, I'm just picturing this giant veggie tray of all cucumbers and some dip on the at the meeting. <laughs> that would have been even better. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, this has been so fun and I'm honored to have chatted with you, Kim Corvin. But remember, we can only be strangers once and I invite you to stay weird. I will. I don't think there's any likelihood of I tried being straight as a lawyer for over 20 years. True. Yeah. Been there. Hated that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Thank you. It's been great.